the subject is the path of salvation the longing for salvation is an innate tendency of the human mind that is each and every human being cherishes an inward desire for all round emancipation but in the absence of proper guidance this human aspiration for emancipation remains unfulfilled i said yesterday that in the pursuit of emancipation various external urges and aspirations in the human mind have emerged just as human beings attain freedom in social cultural moral and other spheres of life they also attain freedom in the spiritual sphere as well this is spiritual freedom means to become one with parama purusha in order to attain permanent salvation from physical psychic and spiritual bondage that is the microcosm become one with macrocosm this is the real emancipation when spiritual aspirants undertake long and arduous spiritual practice they always set out on their spiritual quest keeping the goal of param purush fixed before them now a question may arise how can a spiritual aspirant place param purusha before his or her eyes and why should one do so and another question may also arise what is the source of strength or capacity of a spiritual aspirant we know from our philosophical knowledge that the supreme entity is always with human beings now what one should do is to fix one's vision only one him as far as param purush is concerned he is always watching human beings his vision is always on us if there is some slight mistake in one's ideation all one's endeavors in such search of param purush will become fruitless human beings do karma action and think that thereby they will attain liberation from all actional bondages although it is a true that through actions human beings can attain freedom from actional bondages whenever people perform actions they should always be aware that parma purusha is always watching them and they are performing the action not for their own personal satisfaction but for the satisfaction of param purush when a human being does something to please param purush this is called gopi bhav the sanskrit word gopi means one who is in the very habit of pleasing param purush now the actions of people who just perform actions without any love for param purush in the core of their hearts are fruitless it is impossible to attain salvation through these types of actions devoid of cosmic ideation the path of salvation lies elsewhere there are some people who perform rigorous penance they sit in the middle of a ring of flames and in the process suffer a great deal others remain seated with their heads bent down and their legs upwards thus subjecting themselves to much physical torture they believe that this type of penance will lead to the exhaustion of their external bondages accumulated for lives together but this is not correct the secret is that while performing any action one must remember that param purusha is always watching one section a genuine a spiritualist will have to establish a relation of love with param purusha those who remain oblivious to this truth become unsuccessful in their mission whatever might be the intensive tea of their penance 
but when people undertake penance with cosmic ideation then param purush will himself guide them not to perform such rigorous but fruitless penances as if he is telling them internally just keep doing whatever i have told you to do there are other people who practice yoga according to their belief that the intense practice of yoga will pave the way to salvation while it is true that the systematic practice of yoga leads to spiritual emancipation what is important is the type of yoga that is a practiced yoga chitt vritti nirodha suspension of all psychic propensities is yoga what to call this suspension in which the mind and sense organs stop their functioning and the unit consciousness is also suspended according to psychology when the psychic pressure is removed when the old suppressed propensities of that mind will again be revived and resume their original state this type of yoga is only for display to earn a few coins from the public to fill up fill once belly as a saint observed mur gudaye jata badhaye mast phire jaise bhaisa upar khak lagaye man jaise ko taisa some people shave their heads bear long beards and move like big buffaloes they smear their bodies with ashes but internally their minds remain unchanged man na rangaya rangale jo di kapda instead of coloring your mind you simply dyed your cloth o jogi these are useless pursuits now what is the real yoga sarva chinta parityago nishinta jogi chate if the mind's propensities are suspended then all thought processes will automatically stop will this lead the supreme attainment certainly not theoretically when one psychic propensities are withdrawn this is yoga no doubt but is it the real spiritual yoga or unification no the real spiritual unification is defined as sanjogo yoga utikta jivatma parmatma na when the unit consciousness and supreme consciousness are fused into one that is the real yoga when does this take place when the spiritual aspirants establish a relationship of sweet love with param purush in the absence of this sweet and loving relationship human beings are bound to maintain a distance from param purusha out of fear this is called mahi mana bodh mahimna bodh in the scriptures why param purusha is such a vast and exalted entity and i am such an insignificant creature how can i go near him this sort of infinity complex on the part of a spiritual aspirant is immensely harmful and spiritual aspirants must be aware of this i may be a very small creature and indeed a drop of water is very insignificant in comparison to the vast ocean of water but although we small this that tiny drop of water is inseparably associated with the ocean itself that drop never thinks that because it is a mere drop how can it be associated with the great sea in the same way the orders yogic pr- practice of spiritual aspirants becomes meaningless if they fail to establish a sweet relation with param purush there are still others who think that through the cultivation of knowledge they will attain param purush through knowledge i will know the true nature of param purush and thereby my mind will attain emancipation this sort of thought is equally defective how can one attain param purusha through knowledge there is infinite knowledge 
infinite strength and capacity in Param Purush. From whatever angle of vision one looks at him, one will never be able to fathom him. The amount of knowledge or power or memory that is in Param Purush is certainly lacking in an individual. Then with your small brain, with your shallow intellect, how will you understand him? So a person of knowledge is bound to become a cent percent failure. How can one attain Parapurus through knowledge which in human beings is so illimited? It is categorically impossible for human beings. Only in one way it may be possible if a person of so-called knowledge develops love and attachment for Parampurush and by virtue of that love if he or she comes in the closest proximity of Parampurush and says sitting on his lap. O oh Lord, kindly tell me what is your real nature. Now, if out of love Parampurus reveals his inner secret to such a person, then that person can know it, otherwise it will remain a secret forever. There are still others who think that they can attain salvation by worshipping Parampurusha in a ritualistic manner by ringing bells or lightning candles or offering flowers. No, they will also meet with equal failure because they are mere slaves of mechanical rituals. By following such rituals, these people become bound within hard and fast routine activities. At a particular time, they will light candles, ring bells, clean plates, offer flowers to the deity, etc. And in actuality, as their whole attention is diverted to those mechanical activities, their cosmic ideation is completely forgotten. You may have seen that in the worship of certain deities, some people are invited to the Pandal religious tent and after a while they ask, well, the bell has always already rung, is it time yet to receive the prasad, holy food? They have come to such a state that their minds remain concentrated on the ringing of the bell in the expectation of distribution of prasad. And there are some people who serpentiously approach the priest and whisper into his ear, can you please ring the bell quickly? As for those who chant the holy name of Krishna but have no genuine love for Param Purush, their minds are not on him. They are simply thinking of the word Krishna and after some time their minds become diverted from the repetition of the word and become filled with undesirable thoughts. Such as against whom they should file a lawsuit in the court or whose field will be destroyed by their grazing cause etc. This shows that unless there is genuine love for Parampurus, the repetition of holy chants is useless and leads to wastage of both time and energy. Moreover, if during the repetition of holy names, Parampurus is not goal of one's mind, then the power attained from that job or repetition may also be misused. Suppose someone is sitting in meditation for one or two hours and thinking all sorts of undesirable thoughts. This is worse than not doing sadhana at all because in this way the sadhak's mind becomes even more degraded. There is a local proverb when the buffalo runs into the pond, it drags its binding rope and stick with it. Human beings meditate on Parampurush and wrongly think that they are visualizing. The questions in is how can they visualize Parampurush, the this power to visualize him comes from him on. It is due to his grace that spiritual aspirants may catch a glimpse of him. 
Thus the best approach is to think, O oh Lord, please always maintain your close vigil on me, so that I may always act only according to your desire. Now who can think these types of thoughts? Only those who have deep devotion to Param Purush and those who bear no love for him have nothing to say. If a person at the very sight of Param Purusha starts thinking within, Oh, I have done so many mistakes. Is this the sign of one's love for Param Purush or a sign of fear? Similarly, while meditating, if one thinks, Oh Lord, tomorrow morning I must encounter my enemy in the battlefield. During that time, do not keep your watch over me. These are not the ideal thoughts for a genuine devotee. They do not produce any good result. On the contrary, people should always think Param Purusha is the very life of my life. I must love him alone and I will move according to his pleasure. He is the machine operator and I am the machine in his hands. I will work as and when he desires. What should be the nature of one's love for Param Purush? This entire universe is the creation of Param Purush and hence every microcosm is child of Param Purush. If I serve each and every microcosm, he will be pleased and that will be the only way to establish a sweet relationship with him. Is in no other way can it be done. Now, what is the need to arouse love and affectionate for him, affection for him? In this way, spiritual aspirants themselves will attain bliss. But those who are A great devotees will say, we will establish a loving relationship with Parma Purusha, not so that we can derive pleasure from it, but rather so that he will be pleased thereby whether I get pleasure or not is immaterial. There is a story that once Lord Krishna fell seriously ill. Various medicines were administered, but the disease could not be cured. Many physicians were consulted, but no one could diagnose the disease. Finally, Lord Krishna himself was asked, what is the medicine for this disease? He replied, see, here, if any of my true devotees agrees to give the dust particles of his or her feet, only that will cure my disease. Then the sage Narada made a frantic search throughout the world to find such a great, such a true devotee, but as was expected, nowhere could such a devotee be found. Whomever Narada approaches was shocked to hear such a proposal and protested. How can we give the dust particles of our feet to the dear Lord? That would be the highest blasphemy and for that we would be doomed into the lowest hell. No such devotee as Lord Krishna had suggested was to be found anywhere. As long last Narada went to Brajabhumi and there he explained the situation to the people. No sooner had they heard the news of Lord Krishna's illness than they cried out in chorus, All right, we are ready to give our foot dust for our Lord. Flavor guested, Narad asked them, How can you say this? If your foot dust is smeared on the forehead of the Lord, will you not incur great sin thereby? The cowards of Brajbhumi replied unhesitantly, Perhaps we may incur sin thereby and we are ready to enter hell for that. But if the dust particles of our feet can cure our beloved Lord, that would be wonderful. This is the epitome of devotion. And to please Param Purusha, we must develop this type of exclusive devotion. So you should always remember one thing that your spiritual practice, your mundane activities, your worldly ideology, your social, economic and moral ideals in every sphere of your existence must be suffice with the ideation that you love your Lord and you should love Him for 
only one reason to please him.